The largest gasoline production plant in the United States is Marathon Petroleum's facility in Galveston Bay, Texas. It's a true giant, processing 631,000 barrels of crude oil every day. That's about 26 and a half million gallons every single day. A staggering number. Let's dive into the atmosphere of oil refining production. It all began long before the era of hybrids, electric cars, and climate summits. Back in the days when America was still smoking and roaring, the world needed fuel, and Texas provided it by the spoonful. On the coast of the Gulf of Mexico, in the Texas city of Texas City, a decision was made back in 1931 to build a plant that would refine oil into liquids that make cars and airplanes roar. By 1933, the plant was operational. At that time, it belonged to Republic Oil, and a little later, it was taken over by Amoco, which eventually became part of British Petroleum. Those were wild times. Every day, a new record. Gallons of gasoline flowed like a river, and the plant gradually expanded. It survived World War II the oil crises of the 70s, and even an explosion in 2005 when 15 workers died at a neighboring facility, a tragedy that forced a complete overhaul of safety in the entire oil refining region. Have you heard about it? And so, in 2013, the giant changes hands. Marathon Petroleum Corporation buys the plant. And they don't just buy it, they integrate it with their own refinery located nearby. Thus, a single gigantic system is born, the Galveston Bay Refinery, which since then has been processing over 630,000 barrels of crude oil every day. To imagine the scale, that's over 26 million gallons of fuel per day, and the complex covers nearly 1,000 acres. Over 1,500 people work there, not counting contractors and specialists who service the units. It's like a small industrial city, only instead of coffee shops, there are reactors instead of fountains, cooling towers, and instead of a park, thousands of pipelines. Galveston Bay is the pulse of the US fuel infrastructure. It operates 24 hours a day, seven days a week, without stops or breaks. It's not just gasoline that's born here, they also produce jet fuel, diesel, fuel oil, petroleum coke, and even propylene for the chemical industry. Everything that can flow, burn, and work is squeezed out of every drop of crude oil. Interestingly, the plant's location is strategic. The nearby port allows for receiving tankers from all over the world and a network of pipelines and railways for sending products all over America. Roughly speaking, if you're filling up your tank somewhere in the US, there's a chance that at least a drop of that fuel passed through the furnaces of Galveston Bay. And although the world is changing today, and green energy is being talked about from every microphone, the Galveston Bay refinery is not giving up its position. Marathon Petroleum is investing hundreds of millions of dollars in modernization, filtration, and reducing harmful emissions. Because as long as the planet is still roaring with engines, this Texas giant remains at the heart of the American highway. We are heading to a territory where it doesn't smell of flowers, but where pipes roar, signal lights flash, and black gold is turned into gasoline. Galveston Bay Refinery, one of the largest plants in the US, and production there begins not with the push of a start button, but with thousands of miles of logistics, pressure, and thermal alchemy. The first drop of oil in this story doesn't yet have the smell of gasoline. It's in its raw form, viscous, dark, with impurities, water, sulfur, and metals. It's delivered by tankers through the port of Texas City, or pumped through pipelines that stretch for thousands of kilometers. This plant can receive over a million barrels of crude oil per week. That's an insane amount. The oil goes into huge tanks, so-called crude tanks. Each such tank can hold 500,000 barrels. Imagine that, that's more than 20 million gallons. Here it is stored for several days, where it settles and is heated to a temperature of about 140 degrees Fahrenheit to reduce viscosity and facilitate pumping. Next, the oil goes through desalters. These are special units that remove water, salts, and mechanical impurities. Because salts are death to metal reactors, they cause corrosion and form dangerous deposits. Here, the oil is mixed with fresh water and electrical energy, creating an emulsion that forces the impurities to separate. 
This is essentially industrial cleaning. After this, the main stage, the atmospheric distillation unit. A tower 230 feet high, where oil heated to 650 degrees Fahrenheit is fed in, and vapors rise to the top. And here the magic begins. Heavy fractions like diesel, kerosene, and fuel oil settle at the bottom, while lighter ones, the gasoline fraction, naphtha for petrochemicals, rise to the top. You can imagine this tower as an oil elevator, where each floor is a separate product. The temperature in the column plays a key role. At each height, its own condensation point. Heavy components stop faster, light ones fly further. All this works in real time with control over every degree and every drop. But no, this isn't gasoline yet. What has been collected are raw fractions that are then sent to other units. Vacuum distillation, catalytic cracking, hydro treating, and only then to blending. That is, mixing to meet the standards for gasoline, diesel, and jet fuel. By the way, gasoline itself is not a single component, but a mixture of dozens of fractions that are chemically and physically stitched together into a precisely calibrated formula. With an octane number, ignition temperature, volatility, aromatics, all according to standard. But let's go back. After the atmospheric tower, many heavy fractions are sent to a vacuum column where they are distilled under reduced pressure, so as not to burn them to a crisp. From there come components for lubricants, bitumen, and even raw material for plastics. Then even deeper, catalytic cracking, where molecules are literally broken into smaller ones, turning heavy fuel oil into light gasoline. And only when this black magic is complete does the collection of fractions, mixing, adding additives begin, and at the end, storage tanks with the finished product, which again await tankers, pipelines, and rail cars. After all the formidable reactors, furnaces, and towers, where crude oil has been given a good heating, the crucial stage arrives, final blending. This is no longer a turbulent boiling or flowing in pipes. It's like a chemical kitchen, where a complex dish with a taste of power and precision is prepared from a few simple ingredients. Each fraction obtained from previous processes has its own properties. One is light, volatile, with a low octane number. Another is heavier, dense, resistant to temperatures and pressure. From these, like from puzzle pieces, petrochemical technologists assemble the required mixture. This is called blending. And this is the moment when gasoline essentially is born. It is not mixed randomly. Everything happens according to precisely calculated formulas. The fractions are fed into mixing tanks, where every drop is controlled by automation. Machines know exactly how much of what to supply to get the desired grade of gasoline at the output, with a certain octane number, resistance to detonation, and stability during storage. But even the most precise mixing is not the end. Special additives are added to the gasoline composition, these are small in volume, but powerful in effect substances. It is they that help the fuel work better, not destroy engines, not rust in tanks, not evaporate too quickly, not clog injectors, not pollute the atmosphere. Additives are introduced in microscopic doses, literally a few ounces per gallon, but modern fuel is impossible without them. When everything is ready, the gasoline goes into finishing tanks. These are giant steel containers located next to railway lines, truck ramps, and port pipelines. There, the fuel can be stored for days or weeks, waiting for its time. Then, shipment, tankers, rail cars, barges. And so, the fuel hits the road. Maybe this very batch of gasoline will be hissing in the tank of your car in a few days. Maybe it will power a combine, a truck, a boat, or an airplane. But whatever the case, this gasoline has come a long way from dark, raw mud to perfect, transparent fuel. It is clean, stable, ready to burn, but only when you say, start your engine. Every year, millions of tons of refractory bricks are produced worldwide, a material capable of withstanding temperatures over 1,500 degrees Celsius and protecting structures where metal melts or flames erupt. Just to line one blast furnace requires up to 4,000 tons of this stone that fears no fire. But what gives it such strength? 
Why would metallurgical giants, cement plants, and glass furnaces grind to a halt without it? And most importantly, what technological secret turns ordinary clay into armor against flames? Watch until the end, and you'll find out what they don't write in textbooks. At the heart of it all lies not ordinary red clay, which is used for building bricks, but its special variety, refractory or kaolin clay. Its uniqueness lies in its chemical composition, where two oxides dominate, aluminum oxide and silicon dioxide. It is their high content and the correct ratio that give the raw material its main property, an extremely high melting point. To give the future product stability and predictability, manufacturers resort to a technological trick. Part of the mined clay is not sent directly into production, but is first fired in kilns at temperatures up to 1,500 degrees Celsius. As a result of this process, the clay loses its plasticity, sinters, and turns into a very strong, stone-like material called shamot. This finished shamot is then crushed and used as the main component, with a certain amount of fresh, plastic clay added to it, which acts as a binder. This approach solves a key problem. It significantly reduces the shrinkage of the products during final drying and firing, preventing deformations and cracking. So, the process begins with the preparation of components. The mined clay and other rocks, as well as the pre-prepared shamot, are sent to the crushing line. Giant crusher jaws break large pieces, and then roller and ball mills relentlessly grind them into a fine powder with a clearly defined grain size. Control of the fractional composition is extremely important because the future density, and consequently, the strength and thermal conductivity of the brick depend on how tightly particles of different sizes can pack together. After crushing, automated dosing systems weigh each component, shamot powder, clay powder, water, and other possible additives, with computer precision according to the recipe for a specific type of refractory. This entire mixture is sent to powerful mixers, where it is intensively mixed until a completely homogeneous mass, known as the batch, is formed. Next, the formless mass must acquire its shape. The most common method is semi-dry pressing. The batch, containing a minimal amount of moisture, is loaded into high-strength metal molds. Then, a press exerts an enormous force, measured in hundreds of tons on it, pressing the mass into a steel die. Thanks to this colossal pressure, the particles get as close as possible, displacing air, and at the output, we get a dense, smooth block with perfect geometry, a green brick. Although it already has its shape, it is still very fragile and not resistant to moisture. The next stage requires not strength, but patience and precision. The green bricks are carefully placed on kiln cars and sent to long tunnel dryers. This is a slow and delicate stage, which can last from one to several days. Inside the dryer, a carefully controlled microclimate is maintained. The temperature is gradually increased and the humidity is reduced. It is important that the moisture leaves the brick as evenly as possible from its entire thickness. Any rush or violation of the regime will lead to the outer layers drying faster than the inner ones, which will create critical internal stresses and simply tear the brick apart with cracks from the inside. When all the physically bound water is removed, the culmination of the entire production cycle begins, firing. The brick enters the fiery tunnel of the kiln, where a true rebirth awaits it. Slowly moving through different zones of the kiln, it is gradually heated to peak temperatures, which for shamot brick are 1,400 degrees Celsius, 100 degrees Celsius, and for high alumina types can exceed 1,750 degrees Celsius. This is not just drying, it is a deep metamorphosis. At such temperatures, complex chemical reactions are triggered, mineral particles soften on the surface and sinter together, forming a strong and dense ceramic structure. In the system of aluminum oxide and silicon dioxide, new crystalline compounds are formed. In particular, needle-like crystals of mullite, which, like reinforcement, permeate the entire structure of the brick, giving it exceptional strength and thermal stability. Having passed the peak of heating, the brick just as slowly passes through the cooling zone. This stage is no less important, as rapid cooling would cause thermal shock 
and destroy the product that has just gained strength. At the exit of the kiln, a completely new product appears. A hard, ringing, slightly rough to the touch block that is not afraid of fire. Next, only inspection. Each product undergoes a rigorous inspection for compliance with geometric dimensions and the absence of defects, after which it is marked, packaged, and sent to fulfill its main mission, to contain the flame. To realize the true significance of refractory bricks, it is worth looking at the language of numbers. The global market for refractory materials is an industry valued at over 30 billion euros annually, and over 70% of this entire colossal mass of products is consumed by one industry, ferrous metallurgy. Just for the internal protective lining of one large blast furnace, it can take from two to 4,000 tons of refractories. And one steel teeming ladle, which transports hundreds of tons of liquid metal, eats up several sets of lining per year. A standard Shamot brick of grade SHA5, which is the most common, weighs about 3.5 kilograms and is capable of withstanding temperatures up to 1,690 degrees Celsius. On an industrial scale, this means that millions of tons of these bricks stand guard annually, containing thermal energy equivalent to the energy of thousands of volcanoes. The field of application of refractory bricks is as wide as the hot processes that form the basis of our civilization. Its main consumer is, without a doubt, metallurgy. Here, it is absolutely indispensable. Refractory bricks are used to line the inside of blast furnaces, where pig iron is born from ore. They are used to line oxygen converters and electric arc furnaces, where pig iron is transformed into steel. Huge steel teeming ladles that transport molten metal are also protected on the inside with a lining of refractories. Moreover, for each zone of the unit, its own special type of brick is selected, capable of withstanding not only temperature, but also the chemical aggression of the melt and slag. The second most important consumer is the cement industry. Long, several hundred meter long rotary kilns, in which cement clinker is fired at a temperature of 1,450 degrees Celsius, are completely lined on the inside with special types of refractory bricks. Without this protection, the steel shell of the kiln would burn through in a matter of minutes. The glass industry also cannot exist without refractories. Huge tank furnaces, where the glass mass is melted at a temperature of about 1,600 degrees Celsius, are lined with special, very resistant types of bricks that can withstand not only the heat, but also the aggressive chemical effects of molten glass for years. Besides these giants, refractory bricks are used in the thermal power industry for lining boilers and furnaces, in the chemical and oil refining industries for lining reactors, and in waste incineration furnaces. And of course, on a much smaller scale, we encounter it in everyday life. It is from Shamot brick that fireplaces, stoves, and chimneys are built, as it guarantees safety and durability, reliably containing the heat in the heart of our home. 